Hello, hello. Welcome to the 24th episode of the Veggies Abroad Vegan Travel Podcast with the Chief Veggie Pusher, myself, Rebecca Gady Sawicki. Some of you may already be familiar with Veggies Abroad, but for those of you who aren't, we're a full service vegan travel company that offers custom planning services, small group trips, a helpful blog, chop full of just about everything a vegan or veg curious traveler could possibly need, and this podcast. With this podcast, I hope to bring you guys the inside scoop of what vegan, vegan friendly, and eco friendly businesses are doing in the wide world of travel. Plus, I'll give you a full download of what's going on behind the scenes at Veggies Abroad. Since our last chat, we've gone and come back from our adventure in Japan. And today I'm dedicating, we are dedicating this entire episode to telling you all about it. So I said we, and I didn't somehow miraculously clone myself, although I really wish I could. I am referring to my traveling partner, Matt. He is joining me today to talk all about vegan things and travel and Japan. And we're just going to jump right into it today. So thanks for joining me, Matt. Very glad to be here. Thanks for having me. (laughs) Well, you're my only option. Nobody else traveled with me. So I'm kind of stuck with you. That's true. That's very true. Okay, so let's start with our itinerary and where we went and why. Um, Where did we go? We started off in, well, actually, wait, wait, wait. Before we start with that, let's talk about us getting to Tokyo in the first place because the week lead up to this trip was fraught with trouble. And at one point I thought, maybe the universe doesn't want us to leave. and initially started at the beginning of the week with me getting bit by our old cat. And old, she is AARP age, she's 18. And she has very strict rules about life. And Matt decided to break all of her strict rules about life. And she took it out on my finger. And uh, so we learned uh, throughout the week, and something we didn't know we needed to learn, is that cat bites are very dangerous. And especially if they're your bit on your hand. And so I then had to get a doctor's appointment and a full battery of antibiotics, 10 days worth. And the doctor actually thought, oh, you probably can get away with seven. Nope, I needed the whole 10 days for this cat bite. And my finger uh, blew up like it was pregnant. That was that was super. I actually thought, oh my God, this is gonna, this is going to stop us from leaving. But no, in the background of Cat Bite City, uh, a typhoon was coming into Japan. And our flight, our original flight, we were supposed to take off on what, Thursday? Yeah, Thursday the 15th. And it was canceled. Uh, and I remember us both, we were driving. We just dropped Calvin off at my brother's. And I got the text message that Delta had canceled our flight because of weather. And I thought, you've got to be kidding me. And I remember you saying, I've never had a flight canceled, and I feel like you jinxed us. I've never had one canceled like a day in advance. You know, that's like the longest ahead of a of a, of a flight that I've ever had it say it's been canceled. But I do need to point out the fact that it was entirely my fault. The cat incident. Um, I feel like you need to accept responsibility at this point. This was your fault. I think I've been accepting responsibility since the minute it happened. Yes, I told you I am (laughs) sorry. And so the idea was, let's get the nails on the cat trimmed. So I took a blanket. I wrapped the cat up in a blanket. And this cat does not like to come out of the basement. She does not like to be anywhere but in her own little world on this couch in the basement. Uh, doesn't want to be picked up. She doesn't want to have her nails done. So those are three of the things she doesn't want on top of the list of many other things she doesn't want. She doesn't want any quiet time with the other cats. She doesn't really want to play with the other cats. She doesn't really want them to be around her. She tolerates... She doesn't want you to be around her at this point either. No, she likes me. She she really yeah. does like me still. This episode is all going to the cat and not Japan. That's true, true. So I I don't want to get off subject. But anyway, so I brought her upstairs. As you try to get back off subject again. Anyway, back to the typhoon. All right, fine, fine. So uh, right before we were going to take off, a typhoon was hitting, um, Not well, not hitting. It was coming close to the coast where uh, Tokyo is. And so it was causing a whole lot of havoc. 
And in the background of that, this was also during a huge week for Japan. Um, it's called their Bon Bon holiday, I think B-O-N. And so it's a big holiday <clears throat> week and that everybody in Japan, like people take off, they travel. Um, it's a big deal. And so that caused uh, tons of disruptions. Tons of flights were canceled. They got uh, closed train services. Um, places were closed, like, and then, of course, then our flight was too. And so that then pushed us to the next day that we couldn't leave. Um, and when we went to leave for that, we had to get up at 2 in the morning for that flight. So quickly on the, on the whole cancellation thing, um, there was no other way to get to Japan. There was no other flight. There was nothing else we could do. Well, there was. We could have gone to a different airport and we could have taken a layover in Seoul, but the layover was super short and we decided that that was probably not the best idea. My my thoughts on that now in hindsight, knowing what we know now, if you ever get into a situation where your flight gets canceled, don't redirect yourself through a city that's further away from the destination. So what happened for us was that we were on a direct flight from Detroit to Haneda Airport in Japan. Well, they decided to put us on a flight at five in the morning from Detroit to Atlanta, which means for us to be at the airport and, you know, ready to go in time for this short flight to Atlanta, we had to be up at about two 30 in the morning. Two. Two. Two in the morning. Yeah. Two in the morning. So then we got up at two in the morning and got ourselves ready, you know, said bon voyage to our cats, hopped in an Uber, Lyft, whatever it was, and got to the airport, then took the short flight to Atlanta, and then proceeded to tack on what seemed like an extra three hours on our flight to Japan, which was already a long haul flight and long haul flights for my taste are awful. I will tell you when, what went from like, it was supposed to be a 13 hour flight turned into a 22 hour flight. I think in total 22 or 23 hours, it was something. Well, that, well, that was the day, but the actual flight, just the flight from just the flight from Atlanta to Haneda was, that was what? That was like 14, 14 hours, fifth, something like that. And it it was awful. And, you know, we are not like rich people. We're not sitting up in like Delta One or, you know, first mass. <laughs> we are like coach people where Matt sits in the middle of a three-person section on an airplane and inevitably or invariably every time uh, there is someone that isn't us that's on the aisle row. No, no, it was me this time. Oh, was it you? Okay, it's all melting together. But anyway, um, and then I love my wife, but she likes to do this thing where she puts up the armrest every time, and these seats, <laughs> these seat spaces are small, but she always like leans on me, or she'll put her head on me, or somehow basically just violate my space. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I just needed extra space. I was dying. I do quite love you, but I do quite like to be comfortable. Economy and 14 hours is not the best way for that. <sighs> but after all of that, we've finally made it to Tokyo. Oh, God, it seemed like forever. Um, and like the other bummer about all of that is that it affected our time in Tokyo. We lost the day. Yeah. A day and a half we lost, um, which sucks because Tokyo is giant. There is so much to do in the city. And I've said, um, if you were following on social media, that you could easily spend five days or a week in just Tokyo and still leave and think, oh, there were still things that I wanted to do. So we ended up barely having two days in the city. And that just was such a, such a bummer. Um, so we started off in Tokyo and then from Tokyo, we took the train and went to Kyoto. Uh, we had three days there and then we took the train to Osaka and had three days there. 
um, plus a day trip to Nara. And then we came back to Tokyo and flew home from Tokyo. Uh, so for this trip, uh, we focused on these three major cities. And I did that specifically because one, it was our first trip to Japan. Um, but two, I knew for the most part, these would be the three easiest places to be a vegan. And that would give a really good sense of like what to expect. Um, kind of sets the tone for what could be possible outside of the city center where it's more known what vegan is or there are more options. Uh, but there are definitely places I want to go to on a second trip. We were already talking about that on the way back. Um, I really wish we could have visited Mount Fuji, Kanazawa, Hiroshima, Okinawa. But I think it's like looking at, to- or looking at Tokyo, looking at Japan, I didn't realize this before we went, but Japan is about the size of California. And I don't know if it's like looking at an island and you think, oh, it's not that big. Uh, but that kind of like gives everybody perspective when you're planning your trip. Like you think you can fit in a whole lot more than what might really be possible. I mean, the bullet train does go fast. The bullet train is amazing. But it's still a pretty big country. So you're, you kind of have to decide, we're going to focus on X. And this is what it's going to be. Do you think that those three cities were the best options? I would say so. Yeah, I think I think the other thing is that um, Tokyo, you could easily just spend your entire vacation or time in Tokyo, and you totally right. probably find different things to do and different places to eat every single day. I mean, it's a really cool city. There's 37 million people that live in Tokyo. Um, and it didn't ever seem crowded there to me. Um, there were all kinds of vegan options there. There's all kinds of places that we didn't get to go to. Um, there were things that we really wanted to do, like on our last day that we we're like, oh, we just don't have time to do it. Like we wanted to take that cat train to the cat temple. We really wanted to do that. And that really just didn't work out. Um, but yeah, so... Uh, I think the three cities that we chose, I think we chose the right right places to be. I really liked Kyoto. I really liked Osaka. I do just wish maybe we had a little more time uh, in Tokyo, of course. Um, but uh, I don't. I don't think I. Other than not being, you know, canceled a day, I don't. I, there's not much I would have changed about the trip. I don't think. Um, I think it was pretty diverse, and it gave us. For our first trip to Japan, it gave us a pretty good feel for what the country is like, um, and it was a—I think it was a good first journey there. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think is it those are good three good cities to start with if you've never been to Japan, and they're also really easy to navigate and really easy to navigate between. So that makes it um, pretty straightforward to kind of understand the train system, get your feet wet with moving around and build up confidence so that you can take on maybe more challenging routes, train transfers, maybe if you have to, or maybe even at some point considering driving, things like that. Um, so I would highly suggest people, if this is your first time going, focusing on those cities. And the other part of our journey is that we went in the summer. The summer is actually the worst time to visit Japan. It is hotter than hell. For those of you from the U.S., uh, consider like South Florida summertime weather. That's kind of Japan. Um, plus the whole typhoon thing, which South Florida has the whole hurricane thing. Similar. Um, so it's like not ideal, but this is just how the the travel schedule fell and we went with it and we made it work for sure. But you should expect like extreme heat. It was in the upper 90s the entire time we were there. It was like almost 100% humidity. Uh, I did, I've never done so much research um, before for dealing with the heat. And like we had, we had a ton of electrolytes. We had cooling towels, cooling patches. I had extra, I bought like, extra like dresses that were athleisure type material um i never wore cotton the entire time and sun until our last day uh, and that was a mistake god what else was a summer 
I want to add real quick, just as a little contrast, when when we got home, they were talking about uh, the heat and the humidity here in Detroit. They were talking like they had like a heat advisory warning for the people in Michigan and the temperature here was like, it, well, it was like 91 or 92 and like with a feels like temperature of uh, like 100 or 101 or something like that. Oh, I don't think it was that high. That's what it, that's what they said. Um, and and they were like, you know, just be real careful and this and that. When we were in Japan, it was 97 every day with 100% humidity. And they're just like, everyone's just going about their business. It was, it was hot. And like the sun is like, the sun just beats down on you over there. Um, oh, the other thing that I brought were the umbrellas, the UPF rated umbrellas. God, that thing was amazing. I'm so glad I had that umbrella. I love that umbrella. I think longingly about that umbrella. I will not, not, not travel to Japan probably without that umbrella. It made such a difference to always like be able to block the sun in some way. You did love that umbrella. I also I also feel like um, wearing breathable long sleeve pants and a shirt was a good idea. Um, and if you have like a like a like a sweat wicking type of clothing, um, if you have like like a like a uh, an exercise top that has a hoodie on it that's really breathable, yeah, I would I would suggest that. Um, I, I I used the brim hat the whole time there pretty much um yeah you definitely want to get covered up from the sun i will say um on a couple of the days i i did wear shorts and i and i normally don't but it was actually quite comfortable wearing shorts too um and i almost regret the fact that i wore pants the entire time i was like oh wait this is maybe a little bit more comfortable but then in some situations you're just like this is so hot that it doesn't even matter. Yeah. I think like the biggest thing is like, don't wear heavy fabrics and mm -hmm. wear cotton because it just, it's not going to breathe and you'll be so soaked. Agreed. And it's so gross. The ideal time to travel to Japan is the spring or fall. One note with the spring. So lots of people love to go for the cherry blossoms. It is incredibly busy. Um, I actually, the company that I worked with for this trip that we took, they, I think, they might um, at certain times for next spring not be taking new reservations because they don't have enough guides to handle the onslaught of people that want to travel to Japan in the springtime. Uh, so if the springtime and cherry blossoms is what you have your heart set on, you really need to plan ahead with that because it is so busy. And then the fall, the fall is like kind of getting a bit wonky for them with climate change. While we were there, they were saying that this heat is expected to go into like October, maybe even the beginning of November, uh, which is not normal. They normally have a nice fall like the rest of the world. They have four seasons, but this year might not be the case. But the fall time for them would be like September, October, maybe late September and October. And so you would have more manageable temperatures. I was even thinking like, to be fair, they don't... I'm, the northern part of Japan does get a lot of snow, like think the shining level of snow. Uh, but in the cities like Osaka, Kyoto, and Tokyo, they don't get a ton of snow. Our guide was telling us in Kyoto, like it will snow, but it goes away immediately. You could go in the winter time and pay less, um, deal with fewer crowds, um, have a really enjoyable time and just bundle up. That for me, I would have much rather have worn my winter coat and a winter hat than uh, suffered in the way that we did some days uh, with the heat. But it comes down to like what you can manage, really. I feel like you say that, but then when you're in the winter and you're wearing your hat and your jacket and all that stuff, you'd be like, oh, I kind of wish we came here when it was a little warmer. Uh, so it's all, it's all relative. It's all relative. Yeah. Uh, well, after dealing with 97 degrees and 100% humidity and the sun beating me down like a, what are those easy bake ovens? Uh, 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 no, thanks. I'll, I'll take December weather. The other thing to consider is that typhoon season in Japan does run from June to October. And so uh, August is a high point of um, typhoon season. And so we 
uh, were sandwiched in between two. Right before we left, another one was coming and is actually it's supposed to hit through this weekend, uh, through Labor Day weekend, uh, and uh, might cause quite a bit of damage, unfortunately. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, and it's kind of a long season, but I think it's very similar to maybe hurricane season in the Caribbean for us. So that can always impact plans as well for for travelers. So we touched on this already that we did get around Japan by train, um, which I thought was really great. I enjoyed the train a lot, but there are some things that you have to keep in mind with taking the train. Um, if you are traveling with a large with large luggage, the Japan has a really great program where you can mail your luggage from like your hotel to your next hotel. Um, it's a really great service that works kind of same day. I don't remember how much it was. I don't think it was too ungodly expensive, but that's something you really need to utilize and look into. I think it's by weight. Uh, oh, by weight. Um, because you can't just take your giant um, dead body bag onto the train without some kind of a reservation. So on the trains, there is a small area for oversized luggage, but those require a reservation. You cannot just bring it on and think, I'm going to stick it somewhere. You will piss people off to no end, and rightfully so, because there's just like only so much space. So if you're taking the train, like you could take your backpack, you could take, I had a small roller bag, carry-on size bag, and that was fine, and that fit in the overhead. But anything above that, you need to either make other plans for or reserve um, reserve space on the train ahead of time. And the space is limited. So if you're traveling at a high time, it's unlikely that you're going to get that space. And the other thing you need to consider, too, is how much luggage you're lugging around a train station. I saw multiple people with giant bags, like having to hike them up the stairs and I felt bad for them, but I was also entertained watching them try and get that up there. Because uh, at that moment, I'm thinking, are they thinking I should not have packed 18 dresses and 10 pairs of shoes? Because this was a bad idea. Uh, getting those bags up and down the stairs where there was no escalator is not fun. Um, it wasn't always fun taking my stuff up and down them. So I can't imagine having a giant bag as well. Rebecca, I read this article that um, there's the space at like right when you get on the train car, there's that little space at the beginning of like the the section of the train car, you know, where people used yeah. to put their luggage behind the seats. And in Europe, you just kind of first come, first serve kind of thing for that. Well, there, because you need the reservation, um, like you should not be putting your stuff there. So these European uh, travelers uh, in this article basically put their stuff like they got on the train and fit their stuff in there without a reservation. And the Japanese people are too polite to call them out. So they just kind of get frustrated and uh, have a little passive aggressive anger towards it. And because of where that luggage is, like the, like the person who gets that spot is usually given the seat right in front of those, of, of that little luggage area, like when they book their, their travel. And so um, this person in this article couldn't put his seat back because the person, the, the rude, the rude traveler that was a foreigner, uh, put their bag there and it was so big that it wouldn't allow his seat to recline. So like this person was super frustrated and like, there was really nothing that he could do about it. And other, other than complain and complain, he did, he just went online and put some complaints on there and then it became an article. So, <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of angst about it. And you're right. The Jap Japanese are very polite. Um, uh, one of our guides was telling us that you'll see like in Tokyo and Kyoto, people are very polite. They're very reserved. In Osaka, people will tell you like it is. Uh, so that was like interesting to see the difference in people. So maybe if you were in Osaka, they might have called you out and told you to move your bag. But the rest of Japan, hmm? Probably not, but it is definitely something. Plan ahead with your luggage. Don't just drag it all on the train and piss people off. If you're carry-on experts like Rebecca and I, though, there is still like the spot above your seat um, where you can put you can put like a like a small uh, carry-on bag or like a backpack. Uh, those will fit up there. Uh, for instance, Rebecca Rebecca usually travels with two bags. She she brings her 
Uh, she brings her roller carry on and she brings a backpack and both of those were fine. And I usually use a bigger backpack and that was fine as well. Yes, you can bring on just to clarify backpacks are fine. Uh, anything like that you would carry on to an airplane would be fine on the train and would not require additional reservation or for it to be mailed ahead of you. Um, that is all totally fine. We're talking about bags that you would check, like going on to an airplane, um, that you would not carry on to a plane. So I think that's a good, like a good dividing line. Like if you can't carry it on to the plane, then you can't carry it on to the train. Um, as your your deciding factor of what to do with it. And hotels all have the information of the mailing program. You'll actually see luggage in um, the lobbies, just like hanging out and waiting to be moved from place to place. So just ask your hotel, ask your travel advisor if you're working with someone on a trip about it. Uh, you know, whoever you're working with, they should be able to help you with that. And let's see. Tickets. I made a note about tickets to talk about, but I don't remember what that would have been about. Um, maybe for the Metro? Maybe. So we also used uh, mass transit in all of the cities, which worked out really well. And we had what is called an IC card, and that was preloaded with money, and that was fabulous. You just tap in, and you have to tap out, and then you can use it on the subway. You can use it on the trains. Uh, I'm sorry, you can use it on the subway. You can use it on the bus. And you just reload it as you go with however much you, you know, need to use. And that was super, super handy with getting around and using the subway system in any of those cities and the bus system or whatever, it hooks up really well with Google Maps. So we use that the entire time uh, to figure out like getting from restaurant to restaurant or place to place uh, if we weren't walking. Uh, that was super nice to have that. So I highly suggest... You know, uh, again, like whoever you're working with to do this trip, that you have one of those reserved for you ahead of time, or you can purchase something when you get there too. There are uh, little computer screens when you first walk into a train station, and you can purchase like whatever you need from there too. So, highly recommend that. A quick note about the IC card: um, when you go to refill it, if you run out of cash uh, on your IC card, you typically need cash to reload uh, funds onto your IC card. Uh, yeah, and it's very, is a very cash society. So Yeah, we didn't find anywhere where you could use a credit card to refill it. We could only refill it with cash. But in those major cities, we didn't use a ton of cash. Um, I don't like carrying cash, so I didn't take out a lot of cash before we came, and we came back with extra cash. Uh, so most, like, the restaurants, we paid with credit card like gift shops and things they paid with credit card. There was only a handful of times. I think the subway was like the main thing where I used cash. Um, trying to think anywhere else that we used cash. Yeah, I think that was it. Some of the, some of like the stores, like the little shops, the cutesy shops and stuff. Yeah, they'll only take cash. Um, but uh, yeah, in general, in the bigger cities, you can get away with your card. Uh, but the subways, you need to refill it with cash most of the time, and you're not going to find a kiosk that allows you to fill it with a card. So yeah. that's the point I wanted to make. Yeah. You could buy a ticket, though, with a card, like if you were just buying a single ticket. Uh, but we didn't have to do that since we had the card. Um, so look for the card. Save yourself time. And so with the subway, kind of brings up like some general etiquette. So... Life in Japan is a bit different than like here, or I would say Europe, um, most places around the world that um, like general life is a little bit different and how people, maybe your manners are a little bit different. Uh, one thing that I thought was interesting is that there were literally zero trash cans on the streets. And by the end of it, I was overheated and tired and kind of irritated by the fact was that I could rarely find a trash can. You can sometimes find trash cans at train stations, which is super helpful. But the idea is that you're responsible for your own garbage and you need to take it with you. And like, I can respect that to a point. Um, but like, 
else. So like, can we have like a middle ground with this? I don't know. Uh, that was my personal opinion on it. But that is something like just to keep in mind. Like I know oftentimes a lot of us carry snacks and things on them. Or I'm like thinking like parents even. Like kids carry all kinds of stuff that you kind of need to throw out. You are responsible for carrying that um, with you until like you get back to your hotel or you maybe get to a train station and find a trash can um, that's just not readily available. And that wasn't something I wasn't I guess I had I had read before we went, like, you know, trash cans aren't that readily available, but I didn't think it would be quite that extreme that they were hardly ever seen. I guess uh, there's a little story I have about trash. Um, I, I call their, I, I, I want to call what they, how they act and how things are over their mindfulness. You want to be mindful about how you're acting and presenting yourself around people. But um, a quick, funny little story here. Uh, Rebecca and I, we were getting a treat somewhere. And uh, there was a part of the treat that we didn't really love. And so we weren't going to eat the whole thing. So uh, we couldn't find a trash anywhere. And this wasn't something we really wanted to carry around. And we were in a big department store. Um, and really still in the department store, not a lot of trash cans, but they do have like a food hall in this, in this department store, which is pretty common, like a whole floor devoted to different types of restaurants. They, they're big on this. Um, so we take an escalator down into this food hall from where we were and having this little treat, uh, to find a garbage. And I see one lo and behold, there's a garbage can. And so I'm like, all right, give me, give me the trash. I'll just go and throw it in that garbage can. Well, I go up to this garbage can, and it was for one of the stores in that area. Um, and one of the workers comes over, and she stops me. Like, as I'm about to throw it out, she's like, no. She's telling me I couldn't use the trash can. I was like, <laughs> and there's, there's a little bit of a language barrier because uh, obviously I don't speak Japanese. I mean, I'm tried learning some before I went on Duolingo, uh, but I don't speak it really well. So I'm trying to tell her I want to throw this piece of trash in this can. And she's basically just like, absolutely not. And she puts her hand like over the can. So I couldn't throw it out. And I said, okay, sorry. And then I basically walked away and we had to find somewhere else to throw a piece of trash out. Yeah. That was like, that was entertaining. That was kind of the pinnacle of the, weird trash uh, scenarios. Uh, but yes, it's something just to keep in mind. If you happen to carry a lot of stuff around with you, just like be prepared to keep it on you until you do find it. That's just just how things are. Trash isn't readily available. Were there other things that surprised you? I think just how just how quiet uh, the people were. They're they're you know you get on a subway and it's just silence. Like you can hear a pin drop when you when you get on one of those subway cars, even waiting for it. Um, and it almost feels like maybe not so much in Osaka, but um, it almost feels like you're, you know, you're offending other people by talking. I don't think that you are. I think talking is fine. I don't think you want to be loud and carry on. Um, but I think it was just pretty, pretty impressive how the people are just completely quiet, completely focused, even if they're like friends going out for a night, you know, or, or teenagers just getting out of school or something like that. They're still just, they are silent on, on when they travel on the subway back and forth. Um, and they're just focused on whatever device that they have in front of them and they're keeping to themselves. Hey there, fantastic listeners. Let's hit pause on this episode for a thrilling announcement, a golden ticket to Globetrot with Veggies Abroad. Veggies Abroad isn't just your go-to for vegan guides and trip planning tips. It's your passport to extraordinary small group journeys, carefully crafted by the ultimate veggie pusher and your favorite podcast host, me, Rebecca Gady Sawicki. I've spent countless hours researching the best vegan hotels, food, and experiences. And now I'm bringing those experiences directly to you. 
Join me and my newfound veggie pals on escapades to exciting and exotic destinations around the world. Whether it's trekking through the Thai jungle to witness elephants in their natural habitat or staying at a carbon neutral camp in Kenya during the Great Migration, our adventures are nothing short of spectacular. And guess what? Those aren't the only exciting trips awaiting you. So what are you waiting for? Cruise on over to veggiesabroad.com pronto. Well, how about after this episode is over? To explore our dazzling lineup of 2024 trips and secure your spot on your next vegan adventure today. Yeah, yeah, a lot of device use. I did ask one of our guides because he was chatting with us on the train. And I said, is it okay that we're talking? And he was like, yeah, 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 it's fine. Like, we're not being loud. Um, so I think that's just something to keep in mind. Like, as long as like, you keep your voice down and you're considerate of other people, you're not going to bother anybody. Uh, but it's just like being, like you said, being very mindful of the situation and the, your surroundings. Uh, but it was like very surprising that a packed train of people was not loud. Um, I was like eerily kind of quiet. The other interesting thing in like the subways was there was like a standing like waiting section that's mapped out on the floor where you sh- and some of the stations, not in all, uh, where you should stand if you're waiting to get on the train. And people abided by it. I was actually surprised when I first saw it. I kind of like chuckled in my head and thought, oh, nobody's going to use that. Nope. Japanese seriously do. And what I learned from, you know, our time there is that rules are definitely followed um, by the Japanese. Like, if you give them a rule, they will follow it. They don't really deviate from the rules. There's no asterisk with the rule. It's just, like, it is what it is. Um, Which, like, when it comes to mass transit is really nice. When it comes to trash cans, not so nice. Transit, yeah. Like Like, on the street, when you're going to cross the street, and it seems like there's nobody around, but the the little guy says no walk, you know, like the yeah. not the not walk guy flashes. They don't walk <laughs> most most of the time. They don't walk, uh, and they wait until that thing is green, like right away. Like they're not rushing to get anywhere. It's it was it was pretty interesting to see that. One of our guides actually made a joke about jaywalking because she was like, "Oh, we can cross right here," and she goes don't tell anybody I'm telling you to jaywalk right now. And I laughed and I go, could we really get in trouble for it? She's like, well, this is a quiet street, so it's okay. She's like, but if it was a large or busy street, yeah, we could get in trouble for it. Um, And I mean, that just kind of made me chuckle because in most places uh, around the world, nobody cares about that. Uh, Then you just kind of, it is what it is. The other thing in the subway station that I noticed is that during the week, some in some stations, I noticed this in Osaka. I don't know that I noticed it in the other ones. Is that there are women only cars, uh, which is really nice. So if you don't want to be a sardine in a mixed car, you could choose one of the women only ones. Um, and that's not something I've seen in other places either. That was really interesting. Yeah, that was interesting to see the women only cars. See, is there anything else that was surprising? I don't think so. Not in the way of etiquette. I think we covered mostly everything. You know, we've got uh, we got the manners, and I I think just the key really with etiquette is just be mindful of your surroundings and be respectful. Be polite too. Uh, the Japanese are very polite. Uh, everyone bows to one another. Um, they always thank each other. Uh, very thankful. Like, could be buying a water, and the guy is going to thank you. Uh, so I think that's just something like to keep in mind, make sure you learn general words and phrases like thank you and hello and good morning and like all of those things really do make a difference um, with your interaction with people. And they do, they, they really appreciate it. I have been to some places where I've learned some of the words and there people were kind of like, yeah, whatever, move it along. Um, but I did feel like the Japanese really appreciated the extra effort. It was really helpful. I think we started... We started doing Japanese Duolingo prior to going. We probably started what, like three months prior, I think. I think that I think the the studying prior to going was really really helpful. Um, I would I would definitely suggest um, to people who are going there to get you know as much of that language as they can before they go because um, if you're not used to going uh, to a country. Uh, in Asia, like Japan, 
where the language is completely different and it's nowhere near English. Um, even though a lot of people speak English there, um, when you look at signs and other things like that, it's all going to look completely foreign to you. Um, and having like a little bit of a background with some basic words uh, and definitely good manners um, will go a really long way uh, while you're there. Yeah, Duolingo was really helpful. We both used that. I also used YouTube because um, one thing, and I'm frustrated by this with Duolingo too, is that they don't always start you with like, hello, thank you, I am, you are, I don't know, like general phrases, you're welcome. And they did it with Japanese. They like started us off with learning. Um, Water and green tea. Green tea, yeah. Oh, yeah. It was like, great. So I like can order green tea like nobody's business. Um, so YouTube was really helpful with learning, you know, different ways to say thank you, like, and being polite with like saying goodbye and hello and good morning, because there are different ways to say it. And sometimes if you just Google it, they might give you a more casual way. And that does carry weight when you are use a more polite version of the word. Do you think that it started us with like water and green tea? Because those are such common words there that that people just use those words. You know what I mean? Like they're not going to be like, well, like, like for Ocha, you know, like they're so used to just being like, oh yeah, Ocha, Ocha. They're not thinking like green tea, green tea. They're thinking Ocha, Ocha, you know? I don't, I don't know. It doesn't make sense to me. Like start us off with the things that we really need. Like, excuse me. Thank you. Um, I can learn green tea later. I didn't use green tea the entire time I was there. I did. I did say thank you a billion times. I did. I used I used Ocha Kudasai quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, I heard you on the plane. That doesn't count. Anyway, let's get into food. Uh, everybody's favorite topic. And I know what most people are wondering, like, did we actually eat food? So starting with Tokyo, what were your favorite things in Tokyo? Oh, geez. Um, and to set the stage, there is a ton of vegan options in Tokyo. Like, I posted a photo of my Google map, and it was covered in red hearts. Like, it was like a sea of red hearts. There are so many options. Tons of veganized Japanese food, some Western options, all kinds of stuff like you can find in vegan-friendly spots, too. So there is no end. I was actually kind of entertained. Um, you were wearing a vegan t-shirt on our last day and we were having breakfast in the hotel and a lady came up to us and was like, oh, you're vegan. And uh, she was British. She was like, Yeah, she's British. And she was like, I'm really worried about eating here. Like, how have you guys found the food? And so I showed her my map and she was like, oh my God, wow, there's a ton of options here. And she hadn't done any research. And so, you know, I gave her some ideas of some things. Um, I'm like, you're not going to starve like it's gonna be fine um you're gonna have more things than you're gonna be able to get to she was like wow oh i didn't realize it um so yeah like something to keep in mind like go into visiting tokyo with stretchy pants or i don't know yoga pants or whatever sweat wicking pants you have if you're going in the summer um because there's so much did you have a favorite a favorite uh, place in Tokyo or like in general? No, favorite place in Tokyo. Uh, so that was like the beginning of our trip. The thing that I remember most in Tokyo were the heavenly pancakes I had. It was, it was basically two fluffy pancakes, um, with a big scoop of ice cream on top. And then, uh, another scoop of like, uh, I don't know what kind of whipped cream it was, but it might've been cashew based. I'm not sure. And then they sprinkled a bunch of nuts on top of that. And then they put this delicious jelly on there. And then they spread the rest of the plate with all kinds of different fruit. It was absolutely delicious. You had something else and you looked at mine and you're like, I should have gotten that. You were so disappointed. It was bomb. Those pancakes are great. And so you had those. You actually had those in Kyoto. But the place where you had those is called Ain Sof. And they have locations in Tokyo and Kyoto. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought that was in Tokyo. There's a location there. Um, those pancakes are terrific. But the place I really loved the pancakes the most was probably the last place we ate at, which was Vegan Cafe PQs. And 
um, that's a little bit no- on the northern part of Tokyo uh, in a more residential area. And this place was so cute. It was a cute mix of like furniture, was super eclectic. The staff was super funny. It was super dog friendly. There were dogs in there. They were hanging out. Yes. It was just like such a nice place to end. Um, and you had those cute little souffle pancakes. And so there's, they told us our secret, their secret to making those pancakes fluffy and amazing is yam powder. Hey, you're not supposed to tell people their secret. Oh, I think they, no. Cause they also were like, try and remake them at home and then tag us. So I don't know, people listening, if you want to try and make these wonderful Japanese souffle pancakes, find yam powder and then tag vegan cafe pqs in tokyo you have to tag them if you make them yeah you too i have not looked for the yam powder yet but it is on my radar to do that maybe i'll do that later today those those pancakes were incredibly fluffy they were good yeah Yeah, they did such an amazing job i cannot make pancakes that are worth anything um to save my soul so like hats off to those guys the funny thing is that to them, the pancakes are basically, I guess it's not funny, but for them, pancakes are dessert. For us, you know, you could have a pancake as, as for your breakfast. Yeah, but there, that's, there's always like ice cream on it and, and other stuff. Like my, my pancakes at the, um, at the place in Tokyo that Rebecca is talking about, it had a big scoop of ice cream on top of it. And then they put like a caramel sauce on top of that. So it was like a salted caramel uh, fluffy pancake deliciousness. Yeah, super great. The other place I really liked in Tokyo is the Vegan Bistro Jengara, and it's um, in the in near the Shibuya area. It was one of the first places we went to, and so I had uh, something that, like a traditional favorite there, which was a vegan meat skillet, <laughs> uh, which is a funny thing to say, meat skillet. And um, so they come and they have like the sizzling soy meat on a, on a cast iron plate, plate, yes, plate, I think. And then they put the sauce over it. It makes it like sizzle and all this other stuff. And I had rice with it. It was super, super good. And then you have that same stuff in their ramen. I remember you really liked their ramen. So I made the mistake of getting their, uh, I can't remember how to pronounce it, but it could have been like kobu, kobushi or Kobusham ramen or whatever, whatever, whatever the ramen was I got was like, burn your face off. <laughs> like, like it was going to melt my face. It was so hot. I, uh, Rebecca's like, you're not going to drink the broth on this one. She's like, that's so rude. And I'm like, I, I can't, I, but I, I mean, I ate all the stuff inside of it. It was really delicious from what I could taste, but the broth was way too hot for me. Yeah. That was very entertaining. It's super cute place. The staff there were also really lovely. Um, and like another thing to know about food in Japan. So right now, if you are in the U.S., the dollar to the yen, the dollar is very strong. And so eating out was super affordable. I checked our credit card, like, I don't know, a little more than halfway through the trip. And I was amazed at what the balance was because I thought it was going to be way worse um, but it wasn't bad. Like I'd say for eating uh, at the Jengara Bistro, I think we spent just over 20 bucks between the two of us. Super affordable. Mm. Yeah. The same with like those pancakes. It was, and I think also too, I had a latte there. So it was $22 or something. It was crazy like how affordable it was. The most we ever spent was a lunch in Nara and we both had drinks. Then we had an entree. Then we had a dessert each. And so we spent 50 bucks for all of that. Uh, and here, that would have easily been, I don't know, $100. The other place in uh, Tokyo Station was Tea's Tan Tan, mm. which was really good. Um, I, had like a, I had like a rice dish with some, some, um, some tofu meat. It was really delicious. And you had, you had some ramen there as well, didn't you? Yeah, I had ramen. They have um, a gluten-free noodle that's kind of, what is it called? Con- cognac? Konjac? Um, it's made from a plant, and I don't remember what it was. I remember Googling it to make sure. And that was pretty good. Um, I did like that. And the thing with Tease Tanton, there are three locations, I think, in Tokyo. One in the Narita Airport, and then another one in another train station in Shingawa. 
Um, so there are multiple places where you can visit them. They also have um, their noodles in um, like takeaway noodle bowls. The gosh, I don't know what you call that. Like um, like a ramen box. Yeah, 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 yeah. That that you could buy and take with you home. Um, and if you do visit the location in Tokyo Station, you do need to buy a platform ticket to get in there because it's back with all of the shops and stuff. But the platform ticket, it's only like a buck. So it's nothing big and it lasts for two hours to let you go in there and shop and eat and all that. And when we went, it was super busy that we had to stand in line for, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes before we could get a table. So that was really great to see. I'm glad it was so busy. Um, I had a constant stream of people coming in. So that will be one I think that will that will last for a while. Um, and then, okay, let's see. The other things to keep in mind with dining, and this was something that we ran into no matter where we were um, in every city, is that hours are all over the damn places drove me bananas. Um, so sometimes places will be open select hours through the day. So like a set of morning hours, set of afternoon hours, set of evening hours, or like they'll break it up into two sets of hours or they'll be closed random days during the week, like all of a sudden be closed on a Wednesday or they'll open not until the evening time um, and not have lunch service or have lunch service some days and not other days. Uh, so you really have to plan ahead. Like if there's somewhere that you're like, I cannot miss this place, look at their hours before you go. Cause there was a few times we're like, okay, cool. We're going to go here, here, here. And then find out, oh God bless it. They're not open till five or they're not open today. Or the other thing is that we found um, places didn't always update their Google hours. We ran into that on our last day. We tried to visit a bakery and an ice cream place and there was like a festival going on in the area. So they decided just to close for the day, but didn't update anything, um, which was definitely, definitely frustrating. And I think a lot of places, because they're located within uh, like shopping malls or or other places, they might be on like the second floor. So your Google map might get you to the building, but then you have to kind of search around to actually find that the actual yeah. restaurant you're looking for. Like one of the places we went to in Tokyo was in a big department store and it was, the food was really delicious. Our guide took us there, mm -hmm. um, but it was on like, like the, wasn't it on like the third floor of that department store? Yeah. So, I mean, we wouldn't have found that just walking around the streets and it would have been more difficult as well if we were just using Google Maps, if we were being lazy and not reading enough about where it was located. Yeah. Places and department stores, that's a huge thing. Shopping is huge in Japan. They love to shop. And a lot of these like department stores or shopping malls, they have multiple floors dedicated just to food. Um, and it can be sometimes really challenging to find shops in like the sea of shops. So give yourself extra time when you're going through there to try and find them. Um, cause you're right. A couple of the spots we visited, we visited with a guide. And so she was able to cut down a whole lot of time, not because she knew where the place was, but because she spoke Japanese. And so she just like kept asking for help and like, how do I get here? How do I get here? How do I get here? Uh, cause it wasn't abundantly clear uh, for her from Google. So don't get frustrated. Just give yourself extra time when you're trying to hunt these places down. Is there anything else in Tokyo? Uh, I think we covered Tokyo pretty well. I mean, people can definitely go to your uh, Instagram and see all the wonderful food that we've uh, eaten on this journey. Yeah. yeah, there's a, I mean, I know you posted a lot of the pictures and there's a lot of really good food. So if I'm leaving something out, then uh, your listeners should definitely check out um, your Instagram um, and they can check out your blog once it's uh, updated with the Japan tour. Yeah, I have not added that yet. I will. I'll get to it. So our next stop is Kyoto. And I had a couple clear favorites visiting Kyoto. What about you? Um, yeah, I, I really liked the ramen I had in Kyoto at a place called Injin Ramen. And I'm so surprised you love this place because this place was kind of touristy. It was super yeah, touristy, but the ramen was so good. <laughs> Two guides actually, um, they recommended it and I was really surprised. And the second guide that recommended it, I was like, okay, for real, do you actually like going to this place? And they were like, yeah, yeah. 
the food was good. Well, I mean, you knew it was touristy when they they brought us up to their second floor where like all the other tourists were sitting. And <laughs> they segregate the tourists. Yeah, they segregate the tourists. And then they basically hand everybody that's a tourist on the second floor a bib. So they're like, oh, <laughs> the, this white boy needs a bib because he's going to get ramen all over himself. But yeah, I, I really like that place. But I also, um, I think the best place that I ate uh, at in um, Kyoto was that I think it was called was it called Padme Padme Padma Padma. yeah that was a great place and that was also a recommendation from a guide and we would not have found that on our own it was not well marked it was hidden in a second floor of a nondescript building outside of the city center and it was super cute eclectic place kind of reminded me something like out of the pages of anthropology so I can set the stage like Basically, I I ordered like the, you know, the variety plate, I guess you would call it. And the cool thing is it actually, when you think about it, it's not a ton of food, uh, but they put each different, um, each, each different dish in its own cute little dish. So I had things like, um, like these amazing tofu nuggets and the, these other like, uh, these other like fermented uh, vegetables and peppers and um, carrots and like like tempura and then like a really delicious rice and like a like almost like a like a like a crab cake but it was vegan uh, and like a little soup all on this one plate it was so delicious um, and there was so much variety and. It was all really, really healthy too, which was which was awesome. It photographed really well too. It really did. It really, yeah. really did. That place was great uh, for sure. The other place I really liked a lot was the Cafe Tea Terrace. It's in the Gion District. It's attached to a hotel. Um, they had terrific ramen, and they put like a soy meat in it as well too. That was very tasty. Overall, I loved Kyoto. I I. I feel like it's unfair to say it was my favorite because I needed more time in Tokyo, but it might have been my favorite because I liked that there was like the city aspect of it, but then there's also a very much a focus on the nature and there's a lot of places to like get out and hike and spend time outside and get away from people. And I would say one of my favorite uh, moments of my trip was um, our walk on the Philosopher's Path in Kyoto. Um, I really enjoyed it. It was, it was peaceful. Um, it wasn't, and you didn't feel like you're in this huge city. Um, uh, and we were with a guide and we had really nice conversation with the guide. We stopped and checked out a little shrine, um, along the philosopher's path. Um, uh, it was, it was really nice. Um, the funny thing is that when I told our guide that we had been to another philosopher's path, uh, in Heidelberg, he was like, "Oh, he's like, yes, he's like, he's like, that's actually what this one is is modeled after. <laughs> like they they actually made this philosopher's path based on the one in Germany in Heidelberg. So yeah, no, I really really enjoyed it, and it did make me think of Heidelberg, Germany, which was um, which was an, another just wonderful kind of naturey walk. Yeah, a really cute city too. I did enjoy that one." I also really loved our guide there. He was super entertaining. He started off kind of quiet and kind of reserved. And then as he got to know us, he opened up a whole lot more. And then he got to know that we liked cats. And he also ha- loves cats and has three cats. And so then he started showing us videos and photos of his cats and talking to us all about his cats. And then he showed us, uh, he introduced us to his cat friends that live on the philosopher's path because there are some strays there that people like work together and they take care of. And so like he, they've named the cats and they all protect the cats. It was super cute. Like it was just, it was a cute experience. He was one of my favorite guides out of any of the trips we had. I, I really liked him. He was super great. And then uh, he took us to that, uh, to that uh, gluten-free and vegan restaurant called Choice. Yeah, the pizza was terrific. They're cheese, so they make their own cheese. No, they did a fabulous job. That was really, really, really tasty. I thought about that pizza since leaving and their cheese. And if it would have been like not a million degrees, 
I probably would have bought some of their cheese to take along with us, but there was no way that was going to last. My salad there was just okay. Well, my pizza was terrific, so you missed out. I know. I would have wished I would have had the pizza, but. Um, also in Kyoto, there were two places that we missed, which was a super bummer. There's a Michelin star ramen place called Uzu and then a vegan Izikaya. Um, we actually did try and go there, but unfortunately I am annoyingly gluten free and neither place could accommodate that. So we were able to eat there. Um, but both places looked fabulous. So I, I definitely recommend people go and check them out. Um, give them some support. They look like really neat experiences that are unlike maybe other places. So highly, highly recommend. Um, the other funny thing we had in Kyoto I had was um, that flower bouquet ice cream. And so we found this searching. There's this place that makes these beautiful ice cream arrangements and it looks like the top part of it is all flowers. And you think that maybe it's made out of ice cream, but actually the top part is made out of bean paste. So the majority of what you see is bean paste. I'll be very beautiful, but it's bean paste. And then underneath that is like maybe a scoop of strawberry ice cream mixed in with like rice, um, like a rice cereal. And that that's it. And so it was, it was probably the most expensive thing food-wise that I bought. I think it was... It was 2,000 yen. No, it was more than that. It was it was over 10 bucks, I think. <laughs> when she told me how much it was, I chuckled. Um, it totally was not worth it on like, the taste front, but the photo front it was worth it. It was very pretty. I don't know that I ever need to eat that much bean paste again though, in my life. <laughs> you know what else I had? You know what else I had in Kyoto? Um, it was... I think it was our last morning there. We were about to leave and we walked to that little um, cafe. It was right on the river. Um, oh, veg out. Yeah. Veg out. And I had, I had this muffin there. It was a matcha chocolate chip muffin. Mm -hmm. I had that and I had um, like a sourdough uh, toast, like toast with peanut butter, bananas, and uh, other stuff on top of it. Syrup, yeah. Oh my gosh. Oh man, but it was so good. Like the muffin was warm and they put like this, I don't know what that butter was that they put on top, what it was made from, but it was divine. It was absolutely <laughs> wonderful. Uh, yeah, actually. And that brings me to a side note that I didn't bring up with transit in the beginning. Um, so from Veg Out, we did take the train to Mount Inari. Um, there is a shrine there and other things. And so when I looked at the Google directions, it told me the train, told me the platform. And I was like, okay, cool. One thing you have to keep in mind though, is that at some of these platforms, there will be local trains and rapid trains. They are going in the same direction. They will make you feel like you're going to the right place, but they will skip your spot. And so we accidentally got on the rapid train and skipped over two stops for where we needed to be and had to like backtrack. So it's just something to keep in mind when you're looking at what train's coming and what train you need, that if they do, and they will say like on the sign, rapid or local, just make sure you pay attention to that and don't just hop on the first one because you're hot and tired and want to get into air conditioning. Rebecca, your listeners are way smarter than us. They know what trains probably to hop on, unlike us who just hop on the rapid train thinking we're going to get to our spot and not paying attention, but... Maybe. Well, I'm throwing it out there just in case. So our last food stop was Osaka. And I actually... I don't know. I might have really liked the food in Osaka the most because there was just like such a diversity. I think that's probably what they're most known for, right? I mean... One of my favorite places was Oko. And so Oko has a uh, takoyaki place. Takoyaki is the little, like, they look like spongy donuts. Uh, the non-vegan version of these are very sad. I did not know what the non-vegan was inside the non-vegan version uh, prior to all of this. I'm going to say I was just joyfully naive about it. Um, I won't, you guys can Google it if you really want to know. Um, and then Okonomiyaki is like an egg-based. Uh, looks like an omelet, vegetable omelet. Kind of thing. Okonomiyaki. Okonomiyaki. Uh, so we found places that do vegan versions of both and they were terrific and it was so much fun. The places both were like 
uh, wild. They were covered in graffiti. Let's call it eclectic. They were more than eclectic. They were like playing Nirvana. Um, that was like run by a one woman show. They were super fun. Like I will definitely remember both of those places. There are signs like all over the wall in at the uh, Tokoyaki uh, place. The sign says, um, "Food is best enjoyed in chaos." Yeah, because chaos will add to the experience of the food or something like that. It was it was absolutely ridiculous, and th- I mean, there is literally stuff written everywhere on the walls in these places. And then there's signs that say, uh, "We don't do dishes here. Clean up after yourself." And uh, maybe we'll give you something or whatever, but uh, but yeah, the 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 takoyaki uh, and the okonomiyaki for uh, osakans and, and Japanese really are two very very popular dishes. Um, yeah, it's a traditional osakan dish. Yes, and like so, a takoyaki uh, grill, I guess I'll call it, um, like people have these at home. They have these, they have they like, it's a very common thing for the people to have these uh, in their houses. Well, the guy was actually telling us that he takes his places. And I, I laughed. I was like, you take that on the train because it is a giant cast iron thing. It is not like a small pan. Just pick picture like a waffle iron, but instead of there being like the, the ridges for the waffle, there's a bunch of like, like uh, one inch in diameter holes, uh, like eight of them on on this like griddle, basically. Yeah. Um, that's kind of that's not a great description, but that's basically what it is. The food that that is like their traditional kind of food. They love it. It's their snack food, uh, and to have it veganized, um, it was it was a real treat. We really really enjoyed yeah. that. Yeah. The other place I really liked was Republic by Base. And so it's also another one woman show. And it's a tiny, tiny spot. Um, and she does like tapa style stuff. And she just changes the menu up regularly. And when you first come in, you are greeted with like a counter filled of desserts. And they were all vegan and they were all gluten free and they all were beautiful. And so as we were like waiting for her to make our food, I was just like staring at the cake the entire time. So you can't leave without trying cake after staring at it for so long. And she was super fun too. I, I really enjoyed that spot. That place that really was great. Yeah. Yeah. I, what sort of cake did I have? It was like a cheesecake with a plum sir, simmer up maybe a plum filling with like some kind of a nut cake. I don't know. It was delicious. What a great, what a great uh, sales pitch too, to just leave all your desserts right on the counter yeah. and make your customers sit there. Cause, cause the place, the place is tiny, people. So, listeners, imagine like uh, um, your closet uh, extended probably uh, like ten feet, so it's really narrow. Yeah, and then and then just imagine, listener, there's all these chairs lined up at a counter, and then there's this cute lady uh, behind the counter, like cooking for people uh, as they come in and telling people like to kind of to kind of squeeze into the place while her, while her desserts are just sitting on the counter and you're sitting there and you're like, I can't wait to eat any of this stuff. I, I, my dessert was a, um, it was a banana bread with a passion fruit, uh, custard custard on the top. It was, it was really good. I really liked it. The, the, uh, the banana bread part was like moist and delicious. And the custard on top was, uh, was also really, really good with just the hint of that passion fruit flavor. The other place I really liked there on the sweet side was uh, an ice cream spot called Sorry Sorry. And so they make coconut-based ice cream and it was super creamy and delicious. I had a latte one um, that was great. And they make their, their waffle cones are gluten-free and they're like crispy and delicious. That waffle cone was amazing. I also did give um, kind of what was a moringa azuki bean ice cream there a try. It was funny. I don't know that I would ever get that flavor again. You would definitely never get that flavor again because you're like, man, you've got to uh, try this. And really what you're trying to say was, Matt, you've got to eat most of this. And I was like, well, I have a little. And then while we were in Osaka, we did take a day trip to Nara. 
uh, which is a cute little town that one time in history was the capital of Japan. It no longer is. And it's well known for its giant park that's filled with deer. And the deer are very accustomed humans. They will come up to you. You can feed them special deer crackers that pl- places sell. Um, but while we were in Nara, we ate at a place called Onwa. And I loved that place too. There we had, uh, or I had the uh, karage bowl. And karage is a fried chicken. Uh, they did a fabulous job. That was so, so delicious. And that was a little more traditional place. Like, so we ate in the upstairs area. You take your shoes off. You sit on the floor as best as you can. That was a great place. Yeah. Yeah. And it was like off the beaten path. Like you definitely, you're not going to find this place without Google Maps. It's not too, too far from the train station. And that was a really memorable uh, place. And they, I had a sesame ice cream there with like a sesame brittle on top. Holy smokes. That was, that was divine. Really good. Yeah, 100%. I really liked eating at that place. I didn't, I don't love the traditional Japanese way of sitting on the floor. That's not, it's not my favorite because I feel like I'm always like shifting around and moving and trying to get comfortable. I didn't, I didn't know what the etiquette was with it either. Like I didn't know there's a certain way you shouldn't sit. And so when we asked uh, our friend that we were with, she's like, no. She's like, you can pretty much sit however you want. And then after I found that out and I was able to stretch out a little bit more, instead of just trying to sit Indian style the whole time, then I got more comfortable. Uh, but I was definitely trying to be polite and sit Indian style the entire time. And then I'm like, this is really uncomfortable. And there's not like back support or anything like that. And like, after you walk around for a while, it's like, it can be tough. But the food there was fantastic. I had another one of the like variety type bowls and it had some of that karage in there, which is like fried tofu. And that stuff was wonderful. I really liked it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Super good. And I think like overall, we found a ton of like veganized traditional Japanese food. We had ramen. We had those souffle pancakes. We had karage, mochi, shaved ice. Uh, Shaved ice is a um, is a summertime treat. They actually have flags that they put outside their businesses when summertime rolls around to say that they have shaved ice. And it's way better than maybe what you have in your mind from childhood. And it's not just ice with syrup. It's like uh, cream with the ice with like a condensed normally like coconut cream inside and uh, fruit. It was it was super delicious. I enjoyed that a lot. And then sakiyaki and the okinamiyaki. Um, the only thing that we didn't find veganized is that uh, a traditional treat you will see them. It's like a fish pastry filled with like a red bean paste or what was the other thing? It's not maybe a cream. Uh, I saw them in the train stations, but I didn't see them at any of like the restaurants or anything. And so that would be one thing that I'd have to look into more. But we did a really good job of finding just about, or at least most of the big things, uh, veganized uh, Japanese from like traditional Japanese food. Don't you think? I would say so. Yeah, there were a few things we probably missed out on um, uh, just because we didn't have time to go and try everything. And we weren't, we weren't out there like looking for specific things either. Like um, I would have liked to try and tried some udon, but I, I missed out on that. I don't know as if we really looked for a vegan udon place. Um, but uh, no, I think we re- did a really good job. We covered a lot of stuff. And I think, uh, I mean, Ramen like is just it's so good. I could I could eat it all the time. And there's so many different varieties of ramen that um that you really can't go wrong when you find a good vegan ramen. Yeah, I did not realize that how that many varieties of ramen or that many ways that you could make ramen. I know, right? Like I don't know, standard ramen. Yeah. <laughs> how naive was I? Pretty naive, I guess. I like, you know, in Tokyo, I did find quite a few places that were vegan friendly and had things that were highlighted as vegan. But I think too, you know, if you're in a hotel or if you're in a setting that doesn't have things labeled, like you do need to be aware of like sneaky non-vegan ingredients. And that's a lot of fish. And so uh, things like dashi or bonita flakes, that's all fish. 
Um, and you can find that in like uh, sauces and let's see, in crackers and rice. Like they do try and sneak that into a lot of things. So if you're not at a vegan establishment, you do really need to be very clear with what you do and do not eat. And I think at that point, the company that we went with, they did uh, print us off a sheet of paper that explicitly said exactly what vegan means and what we do and do not eat. And so I think then showing something like that is what you need to do. Um, Otherwise, you're going to end up with something most likely with fish in it. It's just, it's really difficult to get away from because fish is just such a, a huge part of culture. And the same thing goes like, um, so we stayed at hotels the whole time we were there. Um, you know, other people really do like to stay at a traditional Ryokin. Um, and it's really popular and be a neat experience, but food is a part of the stay. And oftentimes a lot of these places don't have a lot of flexibility with altering um, their food. They like to do very traditional options and that's what they do. So that's something to keep in mind if you have your heart set on something like that, that kind of an experience. You could reach out to them ahead of time, but be prepared that a lot of them, they're probably going to say, no, these are our options and that's just what we do. Um, From our hotel, all of our hotels did an okay job. Our second hotel, it was really funny. They gave us a sheet and had X'd out everything that wasn't vegan friendly, which was almost the entire page. And then she it made like a triangle or an asterisk and said da- dashi next to it. And then like made the asterisk next to a few things that she didn't cross out. And so I asked her, I was like, why did you cross this out? Doesn't that mean fish broth? And she was like, yeah, but it's not like beef. It's just the broth. And I laughed and I was like, it's not vegan. So that's something to keep in mind, too, that some places might not have the same um, understanding of vegan as what your understanding is. So it goes back to like having that sheet and like completely like clearly stating I don't eat fish. I don't eat chicken, beef, eggs, yada, dada, dada. Like if you think you're being overly clear good. Like you need to be overly clear because understanding is going to be all over the board um, if you're in like a regular place. And then the last stop we had was the Hanita Airport, which was interesting because there was a place that was uh, like their name was called Vegan Friendly or something, which was hilarious. And they had two pizzas. They had marked their fries and onion rings. They had some bars. I think that there are associated with a restaurant in Tokyo called um, Chaya Wild Food or Wild Table. Um, And you had a pizza there. I did have a pizza there. Yeah, it was decent. Um, You know, when you're in a pinch and you're at the airport and you want to eat something before you're going on a long flight, um, the pizza was the pizza was fine. Yeah, it's not something it's 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 something that'll tie you over and um, and fill you up, I would say. And the fries looked really delicious that you had. So, I mean, they're French fries. <laughs> you know? Yeah, they were good. But you really liked the uh, the kombinis, right? Like you liked all the convenience store food. Well, I enjoyed just checking them out. And so I think my, my last bit of advice to leave everybody with is that you really need to have Google Translate. And Google Translate did help me navigate the kombinis. And so kombinis are a convenience store. There are three major ones, 7-Eleven, Family Mart, and Lawson. Um, and each has like a variety of different things, but nothing is in English. And obviously we already said that the, the, uh, language barrier is strong. So Google translate, will take a photo and then translate the label for you. So you can decide like what's safe and what's not. And so at 7-Eleven, I was able to buy mochi. I was able to buy one type of rice ball because all the rest had fish in it. Um, what else did I buy? Mochi, the rice ball, you bought potato chips. Listeners, I want you to picture this. Rebecca is at a 7-Eleven and she's got her phone out and she is slowly going up and down every single aisle in the convenience (laughs) store, scanning each item to see what the ingredients are and to see if she can eat it. Props to her for like the patience and the willingness to do that. You don't have those patience. I do not. So I go in there with, 
gosh. Oh my gosh. I go in there and I'm like, I hope she's just going to get something and we can get out of no. here. But no, she will spend literally <laughs> 45 minutes in a combini, like looking at every ingredient in it. And then she'll finally pick something or she'll go, well, I'm just not going to get anything. And then we leave. It's fun. <laughs> I had to know. Plus, we had way too much time at the airport. And wow, else was I going to spend it besides looking to see what was vegan and what wasn't. But yeah, I think I had the best luck at 7-Eleven. Um, with options, but every one of them is different because they all are like different sizes. They all stock different things. So if you don't find something at one, um, look at the other. But again, use Google Translate because you might be surprised of what snaky non-vegan things are in something that you wouldn't expect, especially rice bowls. It should just be rice, right? But it's not. Last thoughts that you've got? Um. I guess my last thought is if you're considering a trip to Japan, uh, book your trip, not in the summer. If you need help booking that trip, uh, Rebecca is a great source for that. Okay. You can always contact her for that. She'd be a wonderful person to talk to for it. But I mean, my final thoughts are, yeah, I mean, uh, if you're nervous about it or you're worried about it uh, because it's a different culture and a different language, like just just jump in. Um, you know, don't be apprehensive. I, I know that it can be scary going to a new place, but, um, it's really a great culture. The people are amazing. It's clean. Um, it, it was, it was fun. Their technology is, is, you know, very advanced, uh, and the people are super friendly. Um, so yeah, I really enjoyed Japan. I just don't enjoy long haul flights. Um, but yeah, definitely go. I agree. It was worth the flight. And I absolutely, I was already thinking about when to return to explore more. Um, definitely, definitely glad I did it. And I look forward to, um, you know, helping more people go and returning and exploring more parts of it and watching the vegan scene continue to grow because it hasn't always been this vegan friendly, which is really, really terrific. All right. Well, thanks for joining me today to have this chat and you will be back very soon because our next trip uh, is to Bali and you are coming along with it. So we will come back together to discuss that and uh, we might have some other things coming up too. So we'll talk again soon. Sounds good. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. If you did, please consider subscribing and leaving a review. If you'd also like to learn more about upcoming Veggies Abroad tours or get additional travel help, visit veggiesabroad.com and also join our newsletter. It's the best way to stay up to date with loads of new content, like where to find gorgeous vegan hotels, what to eat in cities around the world, trip planning tips, and so much more. Well, that's all I've got for now. Until next time.